It's a land of craggy mountains, wild rivers, and mysterious forests. For millions of years, it's been isolated from the rest of the world, disconnected by the barrier of oceans and the tyranny of distance. In its impenetrable wildernesses, there are still valleys which have probably never known the foot of man. Like mainland Australia, Tasmania has its kangaroos, wombats and wallabies, marsupials that carry their young in pouches. But there was one Tasmanian animal that's no longer found on the mainland. A ferocious flesh eater that terrorized all the other beasts. The thylacine. For millions of years, this wolf-like marsupial was the island's chief predator. Yet it wasn't a wolf, and though it had stripes like a tiger, it wasn't a tiger either. But the name stuck. They also called it the Tasmanian tiger. But today, only its ghost remains. For over 60 years, there's been no confirmed sighting. Its mating call is no longer heard crying through the forests. Little remains of it except photos and museum specimens. There are skins and taxidermist models, some still showing the bullet holes. For the thylacine's extinction was quite deliberate. A state-inspired extermination fueled by irrational fear. About a thousand kilometers north of Tasmania is Sydney. One of the city's oldest institutions is the Australian Museum. Its director is Professor Mike Archer. On his own admission, he's obsessed with the thylacine and its fate. We should feel dreadfully guilty about what happened here. This was the, the really most beautiful, spectacular flesh-eating mammal in Australia, and the first thing we did when we got here was exterminate it which is why he has set out on a bold experiment to try and reverse extinction. If he can extract DNA from this museum specimen, maybe one day scientists can clone a thylacine. The specimen is a thylacine fetus, a female, preserved or pickled for almost 140 years in a jar of alcohol. Now it's about to give its genes to science, which means releasing it from its liquid tomb. Sliding out. They're out. And the secret lay in the alcohol. If formalin or formaldehyde had been used, its DNA would have perished long ago. Ah, well we have liver actually. Oh really? And there was another secret. Its intestines were removed to help preservation. Fortunately, whoever did it left most of its other organs intact. And we have heart and lungs. Heart and lungs. It's a race against time. It cannot be out of its preservative for more than 30 minutes or the effects of the alcohol may start to wear off. 
Oh, well, we can take more tissues than we thought. Each time the specimen's handled, there's a risk of contamination. All that's needed is one fleck of human skin to fall in, and they could find that they're getting DNA from the wrong animal. This condition's not too bad, considering it's been in alcohol for 100 years or so. So, if they want pure thylacine DNA, its internal organs are the best option, preferably those still protected by natural membranes. So the kidneys are fortunate too, and they sit in their own little sacs as well, so they can be hopefully less contaminated than some of the other tissues. Kidneys, liver, heart, bone marrow, all provided good samples. Hopefully they'll also yield good DNA. some fresh alcohol back in this, don't we? They had met the deadline. The pup would be back in its jar well within 30 minutes. So how many samples have you got now? Uh, ten, eight? Ten, ten tissue samples and uh, two, two bone marrow samples. But while alcohol preserves DNA in the short term, no one knew what effect it would have over all those years. What if the DNA had disintegrated? What if nature's code to build a thylacine now looked like this? If Mike Archer's dream is ever to come true, he'll be putting back into these forests an ancient link an animal whose evolutionary history goes back to a time when Australia was still attached to Antarctica. This has got to be one of the most significant forests in the whole world. Antarctica looked like this 55 million years ago, as beautiful and richly forested as this. The ancestors of the first marsupials that came into Australia marched across this country. The ancestors of the bandicoots, the possums, and even the thylacines exploded in diversity in a brand new land. To understand where the thylacine came from, we must go back millions of years to when its ancestors ranged over the great southern supercontinent of Gondwana land. Australia isn't the only continent to have marsupials. They're also in the Americas, Animals like the Virginia opossum, a distant marsupial cousin of the kangaroo. And they also lived in Antarctica until about 37 million years ago, when the climate changed and their habitat disappeared under the ice cap. Tasmania is actually a piece of Antarctica that escaped the big freeze. Millions of years ago, it was dragged north by Australia. Its shattered scarps, fragments of a trans-Antarctic mountain range, snapped apart during this titanic rift. When Gondwana land broke up, Australia and Antarctica were the last continents to separate. 90 million years ago, we find that they are still attached. But Australia had moved into more temperate latitudes by 27 million years ago. Soon, it would move into the arid zone. Which explains why a landscape once inhabited by rainforest animals now looks like this. And in this limestone desert in Queensland, northern Australia, this is where they left their bones all those millions of years ago. Firing! It'll be on zero and you won't hear the zero. Three, two, one. Ooh. 
So we're your scatters. Mike Archer is not just a museum director. He's also one of Australia's leading paleontologists. There's just a lovely interface of events that was going on in this um, cave or whatever it was. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff, isn't it? Riversley is one of the world's well, when, finest when fossil the, sites, um, and the bones he and his team have found are rewriting Australian animal history. It might be a femur, uh, one of the, the, uh, the leg bones. It, looked, it was vertebra shaped, but it's just the interior of that, which looks like a little forest, beautifully preserved trabe trabeculae. It's magnificent. It's typical uh, camel sputum quality. They are finding evidence of a whole range of extinct megafauna. A giant marsupial rhinoceros. A carnivorous killer kangaroo. Even a ferocious marsupial lion. But more fascinating still, 27 million years ago, in what was once a teeming rainforest, they also found evidence of thylacines. This is the beginning of the thylacine story. We found a beautiful bit of a jaw with a magnificent tooth in it. You can just see that lovely thing standing proud above the bone there. It, it has so much to tell us. That tooth is a very primitive thylacine tooth. The deep time story of thylacines, which we find written in these rocks, is something that you simply cannot get from looking at the last 200 years of understanding about thylacines that Europeans had. What we find in these rocks is anywhere as upwards of five to six different kinds of thylacines, tiny little ones, medium-sized ones, generalized, specialized ones. This was the thylacine's finest hour. And as we come up through these rocks, what we discover is that slowly they're being chewed away at. They're losing their numbers, they're losing their kinds, so that by about eight million years ago, there were only three kinds left. By five million years ago, only one kind left. And finally, by 4,000 years ago, the last thylacine on the mainland died out, leaving it only in that final fortress of Tasmania. But time started to run out for the thylacine in Tasmania at the start of the 19th century with the arrival of British settlers, among them Mike Archer's own ancestors. With them, they brought civilization, God, and empire, which meant English style villages, churches, even grand country mansions. They also brought their sheep, and here in their new southern hemisphere home, they prospered and got rich on wool. They couldn't adapt to Australia, Australia had to be adapted to them. The creatures were weird, they didn't understand them, so they wanted to make it into a kind of a little England. So they got rid of all the native trees, they got rid of all the native flowers, and with them, unfortunately, went the thylacine. Right from the start, the thylacine confused them. They couldn't get used to the fact that they were not looking at a dog. And then there were those stripes which made it look, if anything, like a big cat. You can see the confusion in their art. Some drew a noble wolf, others a cringing mongrel. And when cameras arrived, it only added to the confusion. All these photos are of captive thylacines, in some cases whole families of them. Not only did they look like dogs, but they seemed to behave like them, though some obviously acquired a taste for chickens. But one of the more interesting photos to come to light recently does portray them as marsupials. Here's a family of stuffed thylacines in dog-like pose, except there's a little one sticking out of its mother's pouch. One of the most incredible things about the thylacine is its convergence. It is probably the best example in the world of the biological phenomenon where one animal comes to look identical 
to another animal because they do the same sorts of things. The ancestors of dogs are related to bears. They have nothing to do with anything in Australia. The ancestors of thylacines are related to kangaroos and wombats. And yet these two animals, doing the same basic kinds of things, they have come to look identical to each other, so identical, internally in their skeleton, in their skull, in their external features, that it's not uncommon for a biologist to mistake one for the other. But something was killing the settlers' sheep. For millions of years, thylacines had hunted wallabies and other small animals. Now, a myth grew up that it was a sheep killer. Yet, whilst feral dogs ran loose in the countryside, the thylacine got the blame. It seems that the settlers demanded a scapegoat. So, a price was put on its head. What had taken nature some 50 million years to evolve was exterminated in only 50. In many respects, the destruction of the thylacine was simply a criminal act of the worst kind. A criminal act in terms of the animal was scapegoated and destroyed in Tasmania for the mythical belief that it attacked sheep when there is very little evidence to suggest that it did so. This is the tragedy of this situation. It was not the thylacines that were eating the sheep. That was so rare it didn't even matter. What was actually happening was wild dogs were eating those sheep. This area here, while nothing remains today, was one of two areas at, at the zoo where the Tasmanian tigers were housed. Extinction finally arrived on the 7th of September, 1936. The date was symbolic, an extinction that you could actually put a time and a place to. Here at the site of the old Hobart Zoo, they still commemorate the day when the last thylacine died. The last thylacine in the zoo, uh, which had been here for 12 years, seven months, died in effect they became extinct. So this is the last site of the thylacine, as far as we know it. There isn't even a memorial to the last thylacine. Not a stone of its enclosure remains. And when it died, its passing was considered of such little consequence that its body was sent to the garbage dump. This was taken in the Hobart Zoo and could possibly be our last look at the thylacine. Amazingly, some thylacines had hung on until the motion picture age. This film shows one pathetically pacing round its cage in the Hobart Zoo. Other film shows a more animated animal, presumably near feeding time. And there's that gigantic yawn, for its size, one of the widest gapes of any mammal. And there were thylacines in other zoos around the world. This image was recently discovered. It's of a thylacine in the London Zoo, filmed back in 1930. You're seeing it now for the first time on television. The particular tragedy here, of course, is that the species could have been saved. Scientists had the knowledge. It had bred in captivity. But the political will and the social will to change society's values, the desire even to save the species itself, was missing from the lives of scientists in the early 20th century. But hopefully, the 21st century scientists will make amends. Looks like there might be a little bit of DNA. Yes, something yeah. seems to be clustering. Back in the Australian Museum, Mike Archer's moment of truth had arrived. My God. The first bits of a miracle are in your hand. It seems to be a t just a tiny amount of um, sort of cotton wool all down there, very small though. Fantastic. Small. There's Their fears lines. were unfounded. After 140 uh, years in alcohol, it's some it's DNA it's had survived. Now, that couldn't be anything other than basically DNA that's, um, that's being indicated. What's the significance of this, Mike? Uh, my heart is beating really fast. I mean, we have dreamed about this thing for years. I, I thought about it, you know, at least 20 years ago. 
And I never really thought we'd get to this point. Um, it, was, it was impossible, told, told by many people to us we'd never get here. Uh, the dream is starting to become a reality. I mean, we're not there yet, but step one, the fantastic step of actually getting DNA um, is occurring. So I could not be a happier man than any in the whole world. We are really going here. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. That's fantastic. It was Mike Archer's eureka moment, a moment he intended to share with the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to announce what is probably the biological equivalent of human beings taking the first step on the moon. Nobody has ever done what we have just done. It is the threshold of what will be a very exciting series of opportunities to maybe question whether extinction really is forever. But despite the extravagant claims, science was still a long way short of cloning a thylacine, as Mike Archer knew only too well. The DNA was seriously fragmented. How do we put it together? That's chromosomes. How do we know how many chromosomes we should have? How do we get the DNA viable? It's pickled. How do we get it to start to be in a format where it can actually start to code for and produce proteins? So many challenges. When most of us think of cloning, we think of Dolly, the first mammal cloned from an adult cell. Since then, scientists have also cloned cattle, mice, even human embryos. Put simply, cloning works like this. Pick a cell from an animal, remove its genetic material, put it into the egg of a host animal that's had its own genetic material removed, zap it with an electrical charge, and it's fused. If you're successful, the cells divide, and you've got a cloned embryo. But what is nature's recipe for a mouse, or a sheep, or a pig? In most cases, scientists simply don't know, and they don't have to. All they're doing is manipulating nature's code. But reconstructing that code is a very different story. What we've got to do is something extraordinarily more challenging. We've got to take dead DNA from an extinct animal and insert that into the cell of a living animal and keep our fingers crossed that what we're going to get as the result of this process is the extinct animal back alive again. Um, we've got the control. The job of trying to sort out all this DNA falls to doctors Karen Firestone and Don Colgan. Dilutions of the tooth and one of the bones. What is interesting, I guess, is that the heart doesn't seem to have much um, better conditioned DNA than the, uh, the liver. It's hard to know really where to begin, particularly when it's so fragmented. And there's always a nagging feeling that it could be contaminated. It's ancient DNA. It's um, degraded. It's broken down into fairly small fragments. We're looking at um, two to three million different pieces that we have to put in their correct order. It's also in very low copy number. Um, and it's, it's a difficult material to work with. Like Jurassic Park, they must rebuild an extinct animal. This is the stuff of science fiction. Basically, it's number crunching, and the numbers are simply mind-boggling. Thousands of pieces to put one gene back together, tens of thousands to reconstruct just one chromosome, untold millions before every thylacine gene, its whole genome, is reassembled. And even then, Mike Archer still hasn't got an embryo. Well, I think uh, he is in fairyland. It may as well be called clowning, I, I think. Um, it's so much of a gimmick. Getting one gene out is difficult enough. Getting out a whole genome, I think, is almost impossible. The bottom line, dollars, dollars they would be worth probably tens of millions of dollars. And who on earth is going to put a $10 million thylacine that doesn't know how to hunt, got no survival skills, um, a compromised immune system and ageing rapidly out there? It's just not going to happen. Thylacines, there was one thylacine, 
And this thylacine is a gone thylacine. And no amount of wishing and really good science will ever bring the thylacine back. It's gone. But not everyone is so negative. In a small Massachusetts country town lives one of the world's leading genetic scientists. If anyone should be known as Dr. Clone, it's Robert Lanza. He's a man who combines an aptitude for cutting edge science with a passion for stones and bones. This is a Brontosaurus femur. This is a, a creature that was some 50 tons. It was probably the size of this entire house. And you can actually see where this creature at some point was actually attacked, perhaps by a T-Rex. You can see where the actual skin of the bone was ripped. and It actually formed a callus over uh, the damaged part of the bone. And uh, here what we have is a crinoid. This is a, a pretty interesting creature. This His house a is a monument to extinction. Prehistoric sea creatures, uh, animals, creature ancient plants, even dinosaur footprints. All are displayed like artworks around his house. And it was almost like it happened yesterday. I mean, you can see the smudge marks. And over here, what you have is a nest of dinosaur eggs that's about 100 million years old. Bob Lanza has created his own private Jurassic Park. And you can actually see the shells where the, the shells actually start, started to break off from the egg. But he's also taken a cautious interest in cloning the thylacine. I think it's definitely a feasible project in the next decade or so. We have a number of the technologies already uh, working at this point. For instance, we know with the Human Genome Project, for instance, we know that uh, just a few years ago people thought that that was going to be uh, many, many years in, in the future and already we've already succeeded there. So that's a good example of how fast our science is evolving. Just over a year ago, he and his team confounded their critics when they cloned the world's first endangered species, a rare Asian ox called Agawa. It was the first time the DNA of one species had been put into the egg of another. The Agawa's mother was a domestic cow. Unfortunately, the Agawa died after two days from a common infection, but the point had been made a cross-species clone had been born. I was told that we couldn't use the cross-species uh, cloning to clone the first endangered species. I was told by virtually every scientist that that was an impossibility. And in fact, no one had ever even gotten a pregnancy at that point. And we ended up with a, a beautiful little baby gower. So to, to those skeptics, I say, you know, we did it there. We did it a few years ago when the first animal was actually cloned from an adult cell. And so I think that that is more the norm. I think that the scientific community is, is very conservative, and rightly so. I think there's no question. This is an ambitious project and it's going to take many years to have success. Bob Lanza doesn't agree with trying to clone everything. For him, the criteria is that an animal must have somewhere appropriate to live once it's cloned. It's hard to believe that they actually have footage of this animal. You know, it hasn't been extinct that long, so obviously there must still be some habitat left. So I think it would be really great if you're able to, to bring this animal back to life. So what's the feeling back in Tasmania now that someone wants to bring their top marsupial predator back to life? Well, they see things rather differently down there. Everywhere you look there are thylacines. Thylacine toys, thylacine souvenirs, and strangest of all, thylacines on Tasmania's coat of arms the emblem of the state that ordained its persecution and its destruction. It makes you wonder if it's really extinct. And there are plenty who'll swear that it's not. Cole Bailey is one of them. He's convinced some thylacines are still out there in the remotest regions of what is largely an uninhabited Tasmanian wilderness. The snow is just melting on the Tasmanian highlands, feeding icy streams which flow into the forests far below. 
So it's into here that Cole Bailey, the true believer, and Mike Archer, the scientific skeptic, set off on a trek. For Cole, it's a chance to win another convert. But Mike has his own agenda. He wants to check out the thylacine habitat. They're heading into a remote forest which still boasts some of the world's tallest trees. That's a giant. Yeah, she'd be 100 metres, 100 metres tall, that one. That'd be about 320 uh, feet. Yep, that's about right. That's a tree. If Mike is to bring his thylacine back to life, he'll need somewhere to put it. Their destination is the place where the last thylacines were caught back in the 1920s. It's not long before they're in the depths of tiger country. Oh, hold on. This, is, this wouldn't be one of the kind of places that you might expect the thylacine to, uh, to put up. My word it is, yeah. Yeah, it's the sort of place you'd expect him to hide up during the day. It's not a real lair as such, but it's a hiding yeah. place for their the journey it's around through the... Yes, it's, it's suit me in a rainstorm. It's, it's a beauty, isn't it? Yes, that's, yeah. that's the typical way you could expect them to hide up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Mm. Deep in these Antarctic beach forests, the ferns and mosses seem so ancient, so primordial, that it's hard to believe anything could become extinct here. Maybe that's why it's so easy to get caught up in thylacine ghost stories. This is a man who is convinced thylacines are still out there in the bush, and although I'm an arch skeptic, having talked to him, the magic of the feelings that he has about the thylacines still surviving is irresistible. It's very difficult not to find yourself tugged into that vortex where you accept that they are still out there, still, still watching us in the bush. Even when thylacines were plentiful, they were seldom seen. They were usually solitary animals. Occasionally, they hunted in family groups. Often, bushwalkers felt they were being watched. But to actually see one in the open, you'd have to catch it unawares. But back to reality. There are no ghosts here. Only the smell of charred timber. You don't have to walk far in Tasmania to find the destruction left by the timber cutters. It's appalling. It just takes your breath away. This was once beautiful bush. This once was prowled by thylacines, by all the extraordinary creatures of Tasmania. And now it's a devastated charcoal wasteland. At this rate, not only will Mike Archer have to recreate a thylacine, he'll have to recreate its environment as well. Now they're reaching the climax of their journey. This is where the last thylacines were caught in the wild. Back in 1924, Elias Churchill caught one of the last tigers uh, alive in this, this valley and it was ended up in the Hobart Zoo. It's one of the last six tigers caught in Tasmania. That makes this kind of special. Mm -hmm. There could be one watching us now. And so, yet another tiger hunt comes to an end with its inevitable conclusion. In all the time that Cole Bailey has scoured Tasmania looking for them, He's never seen one. Only his unshakable faith carries him on. Carl, I gotta ask you this, mate. I know, I know that there's all this evidence, but do you really, in your heart of hearts, do you really think they still exist? I'm 100% sure they do exist. No doubt in my mind at all. And I, I'm amazed that no one as, as penguin has come up with one. Mm -hmm. But um, it'll happen. 
Mm. I guarantee it'll happen. Okay, but if you find one, would you consider giving it to us so we could use that to clone the thing? Well, what do you need to clone one for when they're still here? And in Tasmania, there are many who would agree with him. Nearly everyone knows someone who claims to have seen a thylacine. Oh, I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's an odd one around. Oh, they're certainly still out there, there's no doubt at all. But in reality, there's not a shred of evidence that they still exist. Just ask the man whose job it is to investigate all so-called sightings. I think it's very unlikely the animal still exists, but it is possible. So if you had to put money on it, I'd put money against it. There's some very, very basic reasons for saying that. And one is through improvements in primary production in the state, um, through regrowth in forestry, through uh, new pastures we have and new crops, we have vastly more wallabies and, and thylacine prey species than we had probably ever in history. So we should have more thylacines than ever in history. And if it's gone, many would prefer that it stayed that way. By trying to roll back the tide of extinction, Mike Archer could find himself stepping into a moral minefield with accusations that he's meddling with the mysteries of creation. But criticism has actually come from other quarters, the environmental movement and the scientific community. So now accusations that he's playing God are the least of his concern. I see cloning as a, a very soft option. It's, it gives people an easy way out. It's like saying extinction isn't forever. We can fix it up later when things are a little bit better. And if that attitude permeates, then we're going to have nobody worrying too much about extinctions. I have a very strong view that, the, that there should be no, no more money wasted on trying to clone the thylacine. I think there, if, there are, if there's some particular molecular reason for doing it, please tell us, because it's not apparent to any of us. I think you should forget about that and get on with doing something more useful. Now, there are those people who have said to us, this is an impossible dream, you're nuts, you know, go do something useful, make hamburgers for a living or whatever, but stop this waste of time, this waste of money. I can't help thinking about somebody like Lord Kelvin, who in 1895 um, made the comment, in 1895, that heavier than air machines were never ever going to fly. The trouble is, clone has become a dirty word, one that's now linked with the issue of human cloning. And it also arouses suspicion of scientists in their laboratories creating Frankensteins, monsters and freaks. Well, Meet a freak, the result of an extraordinary experiment that took place in the Arab Emirate of Dubai. So this is my boy, this is Rama the Kama. He's a cross between a camel and a guanaco. And he was born in um, three and a half years ago in January. Gorgeous little boy. Rama is and a human creation. So he owes his existence to a scientist, Dr. Lulu Skidmore. <laughs> Arabian camels and South American guanacos, or llamas, are very distantly related. Their common evolutionary ancestor living some 11 million years ago. Not only is there a huge evolutionary gulf, but the size difference also makes it impossible for them to mate. So egg and semen had to be brought together by artificial insemination to create this hybrid. But there were other problems. A camel is in fact 13 months gestation, and a guanaco should be about 11. So we assumed he'd be born around 12 months um, of gestation, but in actual fact, he was born after 10 and a half, um, which was quite a surprise to us, and a surprise to his mum too. And uh, so much so that she didn't actually have any milk, um, so we had to hand rear him. Because of that, he's obviously become very imprinted on human beings and uh, he now thinks he's sort of part human as well. But Rama is no longer unique. 
another karma has been born, this time a female, and she's called Carmilla. It's unlikely that Rama and she can interbreed, but then it was unlikely that they could exist in the first place. And if they are not sterile, and it's a big if, Lulu will have created a self-perpetuating hybrid species in a laboratory, and they'll be lovable karmas, not Frankenstein monsters. And it's a laboratory animal that Mike Archer and his team will have to create if the Tasmanian tiger is to live again. But they had a problem. They couldn't make enough copies of thylacine DNA. At least, not until one morning in February 2002, when Karen Firestone made a breakthrough. She summoned Mike Archer. Not only had she managed to replicate some thylacine DNA, she'd managed to make millions of copies, pure copies of DNA fragments, undamaged and unmistakably thylacine. For Mike Archer and his team, it would be their second Eureka moment. Karen, what do you got? Some thylacine sequence. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So this is the results of the PCR breakthrough? Yep, yep. Um, really nice sequence. Yes, all here. the bases showing up nicely. All the For the first the time, and what, thylacine uh, DNA you, you had shown scan? it could potentially work in a living cell. Best match down here is the thylacine. Yeah, as we would expect. So another major stumbling block falls over. Another thing we were never <laughs> supposed to be able to do happens. Brilliant. Well done, well done. Now they'll store it in a biological library, each gene fragment fixed in living bacteria. At a microscopic level at least, pieces of thylacine will soon move back into the land of the living. There are three critically important things about the library. Firstly, it gives us a living a copying mechanism for the thylacine genes. Secondly, it enables us to make as much um, of each of the thylacine genes as we want to. And thirdly, it allows us to begin sequencing the thylacine genome. And just assuming they can do all this, the process of bringing our thylacine back from extinction might begin like this. It starts at a microscopic level, when scientists inject a reconstructed thylacine genome into a tiny host cell. The DNA in the nucleus starts to interact with the outer cell DNA. By now, our embryo has moved to the next vital step, a mother's pouch. It needs a surrogate mother, one selected from a related species. This is one of them, a tiger quoll, a carnivorous marsupial, which is itself endangered. But there's another relative, the quarrelsome Tasmanian devil. While neither the quoll or the devil are particularly close genetically to a thylacine, the devil has the bigger pouch. Whoa, wee, look at that. And what you can see here is two little tails hanging out and a little bit of the torso of two little devils that are now eight weeks of age. Meet Dolly the devil, and she loves a cuddle. For an animal with such a fearsome reputation, she seems very loving and maternal. Her pouch is one she can open and close. It's the sort of pouch that may one day nurture our thylacine. As our young thylacine grows, it will need a mother's milk. No one knows what a thylacine's milk was like, but there's always the bottle. And then little guzzlers. 
What works for these devil cubs may work for a motherless thylacine. Now comes the moment when the loneliest animal in the world is released into its habitat. It's a laboratory orphan, with no mother or father, no sister or brother, no one to help it adjust to a bewildering world. Indeed, there'll be no one to even teach it how to be a father sign except the ghosts of its slaughtered ancestors. In the end, I've got to do this. The obsession in me about thylacines is going to drive this project forward, and the people that are with me have the same shared obsession. I don't know if this is a waste of time, as some people say it is. I have no idea whether we're going to accomplish what we want to accomplish, but I know we're going to try. And I have this vision of a thylacine a beautiful animal, not just a single thylacine, but a whole population of thylacines living, breathing, eating, breeding back in Tasmania where they belong before we unfairly, in an ungodlike manner, exterminated them. I think we can do this. We may be asking too much at the moment of technology. We may be ahead of what technology can actually do at this point. But if the vision stays out in front of the game and leads, I think we've got that chance. We've got that chance of having our dream actually come true. Whether Mike Archer's dream does come true or not, they'll almost certainly make many scientific discoveries along the way. Some may advance the cause of science, others the cause of medicine. One day, scientists may even breathe life into many other extinct and bottled animals stored in museums around the world. But if the Tasmanian tiger or thylacine does live again, it'll be due to the vision and drive of one man, a man who wants to reverse what he sees as a great crime of the 20th century. And if the advances in science keep pace with Mike Archer's vision, he and his team may well bring about the end of extinction. specimen. Maybe one day scientists can clone a thylacine. The specimen is a thylacine fetus, a female, preserved or pickled for almost 140 years in a jar of alcohol. Now it's about to give its genes to science, which means releasing it from its liquid tomb. And the secret lay in the alcohol. If formalin or formaldehyde had been used, its DNA would have perished long ago. Ah, well, we have liver, actually. Oh, really? Oh, great. And there was another secret. Its intestines were removed to help preservation. Fortunately, whoever did it left most of its other organs intact. And we have heart and lungs. Heart and lungs. It's a race against time. It cannot be out of its preservative for more than 30 minutes, or the effects of the alcohol may start to wear off. Oh, well, we can take more tissues than we thought. Each time the specimen's handled, there's a risk of contamination. 
all that's needed is one fleck of human skin to fall in, and they could find that they're getting DNA from the wrong animal. This condition's not too bad, considering it's been in alcohol for 100 years or so. So, if they want pure thylacine DNA, its internal organs are the best option. It's a land of craggy mountains, wild rivers, and mysterious forests. For millions of years, it's been isolated from the rest of the world, disconnected by the barrier of oceans and the tyranny of distance. In its impenetrable wildernesses, there are still valleys which have probably never known the foot of man. Like mainland Australia, Tasmania has its kangaroos, wombats and wallabies, marsupials that carry their young in pouches. But there was one Tasmanian animal that's no longer found on the mainland. A ferocious flesh eater that terrorized all the other beasts. The thylacine. For millions of years, this wolf-like marsupial was the island's chief predator. Yet it wasn't a wolf, and though it had stripes like a tiger, it wasn't a tiger either. But the name stuck. They also called it the Tasmania, preferably those still protected by natural membranes. So the kidneys are fortunate too, and they sit in their own little sacs as well, so they can be hopefully less contaminated than some of the other tissues. Kidneys, liver, heart, bone marrow, all provided good samples. Hopefully they'll also yield good DNA. Now, we want to put some fresh alcohol back in this, don't we? They had met the deadline. The pup would be back in its jar well within 30 minutes. So how many samples have you got now? Uh, ten, eight? Ten. Ten tissue samples and uh, two, two bone marrow samples. But while alcohol preserves DNA in the short term, no one knew what effect it would have over all those years. What if the DNA had disintegrated? What if nature's code to build a thylacine now looked like this? If Mike Archer's dream is ever to come true, he'll be putting back into these forests an ancient link, an animal whose evolutionary history goes back to a time when Australia was still attached to Antarctica. This has got to be one of the most significant forests in the whole world. Antarctica looked like this 55 million years ago, as beauty tiger. But today, only its ghost remains. For over 60 years, there's been no confirmed sighting. Its mating call is no longer heard crying through the forests. Little remains of it except photos and museum specimens. There are skins and taxidermist's models, some still showing the bullet holes. For the thylacine's extinction was quite deliberate. 
a state-inspired extermination fueled by irrational fear. About a thousand kilometers north of Tasmania is Sydney. One of the city's oldest institutions is the Australian Museum. Its director is Professor Mike Archer. On his own admission, he's obsessed with the thylacine and its fate. We should feel dreadfully guilty about what happened here. This was the, the really most beautiful, spectacular flesh-eating mammal in Australia. And the first thing we did when we got here was exterminate it which is why he has set out on a bold experiment to try and reverse extinction. If he can extract DNA from this museum... How beautiful and richly forested is this? The ancestors of the first marsupials that came into Australia marched across this country. The ancestors of the bandicoots, the possums, and even the thylacines exploded in diversity in a brand new land. To understand where the thylacine came from, we must go back millions of years to when its ancestors ranged over the great southern supercontinent of Gondwanaland. Australia isn't the only continent to have marsupials. They're also in the Americas, animals like the Virginia opossum, a distant marsupial cousin of the kangaroo. And they also lived in Antarctica until about 37 million years ago, when the climate changed and their habitat disappeared under the ice cap. Tasmania is actually a piece of Antarctica that escaped the big freeze. Millions of years ago, it was dragged north by Australia. Its shattered scarps, fragments of a trans-Antarctic mountain range, snapped apart during this titanic rift. When Gondwana land broke up, Australia and Antarctica were the last continents to separate. 90 million years ago, we find that they are still attached. 